going to go ahead and get started. Um, just a quick introduction. I'm Dr. Cremone. I am the principal here at South Fayette Middle School. Um, this is my first year as principal, so I'm really excited to be here um, and to be with this amazing team of teachers and paraprofessionals and secretaries and Dr. Maurer. Um, I, I couldn't have made this transition without Dr. Maurer. He's been amazing. Uh, so just a quick little um, background is I, um, I started my teaching career at Keystone Oaks High School and Middle School, and then I was an assistant principal at Mount Lebanon High School, and then most recently um, was an assistant principal at North Allegheny, um, one of the middle schools at North Allegheny. And then last year I was the K to 12 and then six to 12 principal at the North Allegheny Cyber Academy. Um, but I live here in South Fayette. I have a, a daughter who's in first grade and I have a son who is four. Uh, so he is, he'll be in kindergarten next year. Actually, he'll be five tomorrow. So um, we're really happy to be here in the district. Um, I couldn't be more excited than to work with your children here every day. Um, so I just wanted to just do a quick introduction and um, thank you for attending today. And then I'll just uh, quickly introduce myself. I'm, I'm Dr. Kevin Maurer. I um, have been at South Fayette through and through, through my career. I uh, previously taught for six years in the school district, teaching uh, music and band, instrumental music. I uh, worked with the marching band, uh, began a jazz ensemble in the middle school and high school. Um, and then after those six years, I became the assistant principal and now associate principal in, in the middle school and love working with our staff. Great, great team of adults that are just uh, so caring uh, and nurturing for our middle school students, helping them through uh, that, those transition years in middle school. Um, also have to say that we've loved working and partnering with families and parents, um, through, especially through the PAC organization, the Parent Advisory Council. We find that this is a beneficial way to keep a connection open with our, with our parents and our families. And um, it's just another supportive layer. Again, we are so thankful for all of you joining us live today and those that will join us uh, later online uh, watching this video. So um, we, we can't say enough great things about our community partners and our parents and families. Uh, they really are such an important piece of what makes our school so successful. So uh, thank you. It's, it's good to see all of you meet you virtually and uh, we'll continue with our presentation. So thank you. So um, an, an agenda for today, um, we have three, we have four teachers um, who are joining us today. Uh, the first part of our agenda will be teaming and team names, and that will be Mr. Taylor, Mrs. Hoffman, and Mrs. Beinecke. Um, and then I'll, I will have them introduce themselves when they get started on their portion of it. And then um, we have, we'll do a little canvas with Mrs. Harris. And then um, the, the next portion, Dr. Maurer and I will talk about, and then um, we already talked about the sign-in form that is in the chat. So I am now going to turn it over to Team Starry Night, uh, Mr. Taylor, Mrs. Hoffman, and Mrs. Beinecke. Hi, I'm Mrs. Hoffman. I teach seventh grade language arts. Um, this is my 14th year of teaching and I've taught all years at South Fayette. I am also a resident in the district. My daughter just started kindergarten with Mrs. Gagliardino and we love it so far. Actually, it was a rough start, but we're getting better. And um, she's, she's doing well, she loves it. And um, I have another daughter who is three and she can't wait to go to school. So um, I love being in the district. I love being here. I grew up locally and um, I think it's it speaks to the fact that you know so many of us who work here also live here and want our kids to go to school here so it's a great place to be um we're happy to be uh sharing this time with you today mr taylor is also here do you want to give yourself a little intro there mr taylor and then mrs beinecke before we start my name's david taylor i teach seventh grade pre-algebra and algebra um this is my 20 sixth year in south fayette i spent the first 16 in the high school and uh, the last 10 here in the middle school um, with this um, amazing small group of teachers. Um, we, uh, um, I think that we're the first ones that actually have done the entire team naming process. Um, and um, we had a little bit of inspiration um, with a poster that was in my mind of uh, talking through all of this. So I'm gonna let Mrs. Hoffman um, uh, 
do that um, part of what we're doing here. But uh, I also live in the district. I can actually see that my front porch from my classroom window, so it makes the commute a lot easier. Uh, my son Isaac's in eighth grade, and uh, and that's it. So, and my wife Kimberly is an ICU nurse and teaches PTC. I'll just do a quick introduction. My name is Alyssa Beinecke. I am one of the seventh grade science teachers here at South Fayette. I also live in the district. Um, I have a daughter, Gabriella, who's in sixth grade, so she's in our building now, and then my son, Liam, who's in third grade. Um, I'm just excited to have the opportunity to kind of talk with you guys. Um, we have a great team, mini team. Um, uh, they are just an awesome group to work with. Uh, these kids have been wonderful this year. I'm so very proud of them. Thank you so much. Yes. So um, we do love working together and um, we have many little mini teams within our big seventh grade team here where we work in departments sometimes. And also we're fortunate to have time to meet as a mini team um, weekly. And we stop in and kind of have our own little impromptu mini team meetings when we need them. And uh, we found out kind of at the beginning of the year here that we were given the option this year of coming up with a team name that we can carry over from year to year. Um, prior to this year, we had the students uh, and with us, we created um, the names of the teams every year. And that was great. I mean, it was a, a longer process, a difficult process for the kids to you know, be given a theme, to have to agree among 90 students on one name was definitely difficult. And I think the hardest part of it for us and why we switched to this kind of permanent team name, um, the hardest part was finding these great activities um, and then not being able to kind of perfect them in the years that that came, uh, you know, to follow. So every year we had a new team name. And, and um, I think with good practice of, of just teaching in general, anytime you redo a lesson, you have time to reflect and you can fix it and make it better. And that is, I think, what we already are, are doing after our first intro to this new team name this year. So our team name was chosen as um, Team Starry Night. Uh, we uh, have a space theme as a seventh grade as a whole. And so each one of our teams has its own name. And I'm not sure uh, Mrs. Harris can share maybe her team name too, but I know we have Team Supernova and it just follows that space theme. And so we chose Team Starry Night, but for many different reasons. So um, when we chose that name, of course, we have the photo in the background of Van Gogh artwork, which is also hanging and has been hanging in Mr. Taylor's room for years. And uh, when we started thinking about, you know, a, a team name and what would be appropriate, of course, we wanted to incorporate all of the, um, uh, I guess, core subjects, but everything that the kids learn, uh, not only the arts, but also their sciences and their math. And um, we wanted to create a community within our middle school community. So where that began was here, where we found this team name and started researching. And as we started researching this artwork and just Van Gogh's life, there is, a, we probably could have done a full week of, of lessons on the um, science and the art that uh, and the math that is behind this artwork. And so we knew immediately after we chose it and started to research that this had to be the name because there are endless possibilities of activities that we can do um, because the history is out there. I mean, there's a museum, there's a display in Pittsburgh right now, a Van Gogh display. Um, and so there is so much information. We knew we could create um, many opportunities throughout the school year to bring this theme back into our team building activities that we do. So that's where we started. Um, what you're seeing here was actually artwork that was completed by one of our current students. Um, we did not assign this to any of the students, but we even since this was received, um, have received additional pieces of artwork that students just felt moved to create on their own after our first team building day. So that was a sign immediately when we received it the next day after our first team building kickoff that um, it struck a chord. You know, these these students were were very much um, in a good way, um, thrilled to be part of a team. They were so excited to work together on our team kickoff day. And uh, they're excited. They're excited to have a community and to feel that belonging that they might have been missing when they were in the cyber, you know, um, kind of setting last year where we weren't able to do these sort of team building activities. So that was where it began. We received an inbox message and uh, we shared it with our principals and said, look at this. This was so cool. And that's how we ended up here today sharing it with you. So I'm not sure if um, the whole presentation is embedded there, but if it if it is, am I able? Oh, I'm not able to click. Right. 
So I don't know if you want to click into that. Yeah. So this is just the presentation that we shared with our students on the day when we had our team building kickoff. We pulled everybody into one large space here and um, plenty of room to move around. And if you just click to that next slide, um, you'll see that we started uh, explaining to the kids, you know, what a brief history of um, Van Gogh and the artwork. And if you click on to the next slide, um, that just gave them a little background on where our image came from that they are now seeing everywhere. Uh, and then we went into starting to connect their core subjects. So we started to connect that there is an unexpected math behind Van Gogh's Starry Night. Um, and Mr. Taylor and Mrs. Beinecke, feel free to step in anytime here if you want to add anything. But um, on the next slide, you'll see that we then had the kids go in and explore that every artist, including themselves, because every child is an artist, we tried to express that to them, is influenced by someone or something that has come before them. And that all of these artists were influenced. For instance, Van Gogh was influenced by Walt Whitman. And as they get into even current music, um, they will find that the music they are listening to will have allusions to these um, pieces of art and artists from their past. And they don't pick them up immediately, but when you point them out to them, they say, oh, it's like a light bulb goes off and they realize it, it all comes full circle and, and that um, they will be influenced to create their own versions of art as they already have been um, by their own experiences in our classrooms. So if you click forward, you'll see we then provided just many opportunities for them to learn um, that day, different lessons, even regarding their own lives. And um, as they, read through the history of Van Gogh and they found out that, you know, he, he had struggles in his life, like all of us do and have, especially in the last two years specifically. And we thought this would hit home for so many students. He had a lot of mental struggles where he was feeling overwhelmed, unsure, confused, as we all have in the past couple of years. And, um, you know, we really went through and talked about how his artwork, uh, it really showed that you have to look beyond the bars, so to speak. He was in an asylum at one point because of his um, his uh, mental breakdown that he had. And though his artwork and the most known well artwork came out of that experience for him. And so we tried to show them that, you know, you have to look beyond your current setting and see the future and see that things can change and will change. And there is beauty out there. So we went through this long explanation of that with them. They read, they watched videos. And if you click to the next slides, please, you will see that um, it. you can keep clicking. We tried to give them options of what they could watch in the time that we had them together. So there were, um, you know, the journey of his life was explained in more detail. It also then went on to show, um, if you click to the next one, I think that's where they'll see the virtual tour of the museum. Yes, there are seven different parts because we can't fill a trip to the museum right now, um, but it flew them through the museum in, in a 4K tour and they could see the artwork on the walls and just kind of really immerse themselves. And then this is where we kind of landed after about an hour of them exploring our, our theme of our team. And we land, landed on this quote and it says, the great things are not done by impulse, by a series of small things that are brought together, just like us, right? Each one of us brought together to be part of one big team, one big picture. Great things are not accidental, but must certainly be willed. And from there, um, if you click to the next slide, we had the kids start to work individually to build that community image, literally. So they each got a piece of tile that you can see there on the bottom right of your screen. And I have them right here to show you too. Um, but they each got a blank tile and they had no idea what this was. So each one of them was different. And we said, okay, go ahead and create your artwork and do whatever you feel moved to do, inspired by what you saw today, what you read. And as they created their artwork, it was beautiful. They went, some of them um, did not follow the lines at all, created their own art within the art. But ultimately, as you can see, the pictures, and they haven't even seen this yet, but the pictures will come together to form the Starry Night photo, one of the photos of a bouquet of flowers that we thought was symbolic as well. And um, these will be up on our wall for the students to see all year. 
So it really is showing them that we are each just one little piece of this big picture of their seventh grade year, but that we all work together um, as a community. We help each other um, you know, to make it the experience that we want it to be. So if you click forward, I think you'll see there were um, a couple of things that we actually didn't get to because this was our first time doing it. Again, we'll reflect and fix for next year. But if you flip forward, you'll see um, we have a board game too that we found that the kids will be playing the next time that we join together as a mini team. Um, we'll show them also the hundreds of photos that Mr. Taylor took that day with his professional um, camera that they'll be able to enjoy to music because they are each kind of in their own little world that day working on their artwork. So they'll get to see that, um, you know, they what each of them were doing. And uh, as they enjoy that, they'll then go on to work on their board game and we'll work on some student led conference things that day. So. Going forward, the beauty, like I said, of this team building experience and of having a team name, it might seem silly to some people like what I mean, it's just a name. It's not just a name. These kids take on this as a second identity. And it is so important, especially for, you know, our most shy of students who don't reach out to, to other kids and ask questions and kind of find the community on their own. It draws them in. They are pulled into a community, whether they like it or not at first, and they they learn to love it. And um, that way they all feel supported by each other and they get to work with other kids they might not get to work with outside of school or in their classes. And they also get to know us on a different level, which then opens the doors to them asking us more questions in class, um, reaching out for tutoring help if they need it. And we're just super excited. I mean, we love this um, concept. It is definitely appropriate for middle school and really for any level. But these kids are grasping onto this like they never have before. I mean, they they loved the whole day that we did with them. We weren't sure how they would take it on. Again, Van Gogh, art, some of them immediately might have you know, shot it down in their minds. But by the end, they were into it. You, I mean, we will share the pictures later, I'm sure. But um, it was uh, it was an awesome experience. And the messages we received from the kids afterward and the artwork that is still coming in from, I, I just got one yesterday from another student who said, hey, I made this and I just wanted to show it to you. I, I was really moved by that day. Um, it just showed us that there, it's going to be a great year. You know, we set it off uh, on, a, on a good note here. And um, they are excited as we are. So Mr. Taylor, Mrs. Beinecke, do you have anything that you wanted to add there? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be so long winded, but I'm excited about it. So it was a good day. I just feel that, you know, creating that safe space at the middle school is crucial, um, especially for a seventh grade student. Um, so I think having that opportunity uh, with them, the discussions that they had just walking through and listening, um, Creating that safe space where students could raise their hand and ask questions and not be embarrassed um, was just amazing to see. So providing them the opportunity and that time and then continuing on uh, throughout the school year doing that, um, just like Mrs. Hoffman said, it just, you know, definitely comes into the classroom as well. Just building that rapport is so important at this at this level, at this age. Um, and this is just one opportunity for them. And. I, there's a, I have a couple thoughts. The, the first one is, is that, you know, I, um, there's something to be, I, I actually was blown away by the fact that um, the artwork by the, the number of students um, to, to see that you, you, you have, you have 12 year old, you know, there and they're learning something about something that they've seen a number of different times they've seen in my classroom, but there's more of a story behind it. Um, and then for them to be moved to take their own time to do that is uh, is it gives you the the uh, gives you the goosebumps. So um, it, it, that is a good thing. The other thing that became very apparent to us was th these students hadn't actually been together doing anything like this for over you know I mean we're pushing two years and um, and it was and I even said to my colleagues that day that, that today that day was the first day that I felt like we were more normal um and uh and, and i on a personal level i think i needed that you know i it's not been easy on any of us but um it's it was definitely it, it's it's kind of rekindling and, and inspiring um to be honest and and it, and and also to be to be blunt you know i think that you know when you realize that um you know that van gogh painted this this painting that in an asylum, looking through bars, um, he looked beyond all of those bars to kind of interpret what he 
saw and what his future was. Um, you know, I, I'm not one that shares a lot of personal stories in class. I'm, I'm not that guy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very much, you know, about, you know, trying to maintain some type of consistency and order, but when appropriate, I do. And, you know, I, I lost my parents very early on, um, after, um, not due to COVID, but, um, they lived with us and, and they, I lost both of them in the course of four months. And, and, you know, that's been a struggle along with some other friends. And of course, as some of you are aware, you know, we lost a teacher here. It's a very good friend of ours and very good friend of mine at the very beginning of the year. And, you know, it, those, those struggles are, are real and they're, they're real for us and they're real for the kids and they're real for all your families in this community and, you know, this country and the world. Um, but, um, you know, I, sh I shared a little bit of that and, and it, at an appropriate level and, and they could they could understand the connection that I was making you know when I sit in my room and I, I look over there and I, I see that painting I, I it brings me a reminder that there is something beyond what is in front of us right now that might feel limiting or you know cause um, pain or, or 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 make it feel as if we're like all you know um, struggling and and I could see that you know like that moment you know what mrs. Hoffman said about you know that that sharing and that community that we built you can even just see it in class right now there's a different attitude um not only with me but i think with each other with with them amongst themselves um and with the three of us in general um just after that so it is important and uh, you know it was a shame that we didn't get a chance to do that you know last year and 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 we just kind of shut everything down there in march of 2020 and you know didn't get to finish in a fashion that we like so anyway um we all knew that mrs hoffman was going to um go on um about all of this um and uh so we appreciate her doing that and but i wanted to give you the rest of what happened there and uh, we appreciate you being here today to listen to our team starry night story thank you so much mr taylor for sharing their personal stories and, and uh, to mrs hoffman mrs beinecke thank you so much for your presentation I, I think it's important you know i can't we probably couldn't say it as well as these teachers already have just about the importance of the teaming model at the middle school i mean clearly there's benefits to to uh, the opposite of having a junior high model you have only a few teachers that you're seeing throughout the day instead of nine periods of nine different faces so it really does create this bond that i think our teachers see every year um, and and we see it at an administrative level how students that maybe aren't as in, integrated in after school activities clubs sports where they do seem to have this other identity they know familiar faces on their mini team that they can go to if there's friend breakdowns relationship they know that there's familiar faces they can feel comfortable with so um, we have definitely see the benefits of it and um, you know it's backed as well by research and uh, the national association for middle level educators has a highly recommended a teaming model and um, also the block scheduling that we have has uh, benefited us as well in that regard creating those bonds so this was kind of a look into one team you know and their and the way that they are viewing teaming and, the, and their team name and their themes and how they've integrated it and obviously they've taken it and run wild with it and uh, we truly appreciate that and that's why we wanted to highlight that as far as our other teams we encourage um, you to ask your child about their team their team name um, if, if they haven't already done some theming or some activities like this team has they might uh, throughout the school year and how they integrate it into reward activities and those type of things. So um, please ask your child, you know, what is your team name? What's your, you know, how are you involved with your mini team? What have you guys done anything with themes? Um, because they, if they haven't yet, they certainly will this year. So um, thank you to uh, our, our mini team for joining us today. So our next part of the presentation is about Canvas. So um, many of you may be familiar with Canvas, but you might not be familiar with all that Canvas has to offer. So we have our Canvas expert, Ms. Harris here. Um, she is gonna talk you through um, some of the, the logistics of it and how you can get the most out of Canvas and really um, get that view into what's happening in the classroom. So you got the teaming view from, from one group and now you'll get um, the, the curriculum, the, the how you can see what's happening in each class view from Mrs. Harris. So I'm gonna turn it over to her. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you, Dr. Cremone. Uh, I am a seventh grade ELA and history teacher. Uh, I am the Canvas teacher leader here at the middle school, along with an eighth grade teacher, Josh Bacosi. 
Um, my information is going to be much more clinical and not as maybe emotional. Um, um, it's, it's hard to get super, you know, um, what's the word, uh, inspired by Canvas, but it certainly does have, as Dr. Kamon said, a lot to offer. So I'm just going to start with the basics of what Canvas is. If you're not familiar with it at all, it's an LMS or learning management system. And what that means is it's a way for teachers and staff to provide content to students in a way that's digital. So it's similar to Google Classroom, but it has so much more to offer than Google Classroom. And here, um, 3 through 12, and actually K to 12, we do use Canvas. And again, because it just offers so many more features. So uh, Canvas was rolled out last year. So again, you're probably somewhat familiar with it or have seen your, your student on it. Um, but I can give you a little bit of an overview of how you can use Canvas to your advantage as parents as well to kind of, you know, have students start taking the ownership of their own learning and being independent while also maybe still checking in and having the ability to facilitate that independence. Um, so at the bottom of the slide, there are three different um, resources for you. The first is a video, the Canvas Parent app. This video, um, it's like four or five minutes long. Um, and we won't play it now, I think maybe just for time, but it does show some of the main features that the Canvas Parent app has for you. And it shows you how to sign up as a, what, what, what Canvas calls a parent observer. Um, the next is just different observer guides. So yeah, Mr. Maurer, if you want to click on that, Dr. Maurer, sorry. Um, so on this, this link has many, many different guides. Really, whatever you're looking for, it just has the general observer guide, observer videos, you name it. If you have a question, you can find it here. And then the last link um, that's on the slides is just like a quick PDF that shows the difference between the app and the browser view. Because one thing that I've noticed even just in my implementation and explaining um, of the Canvas parent observer feature to students, or I'm sorry, to parents rather, is that the app, while great, is still limited in what it allows parents to do. So from a browser, you can do a lot more as well. The app is great, like I said, but on the browser, there's even more features that parents have. And that kind of walks you through the differences there. Just as a very quick overview, if you sign up as a Canvas parent observer, what that allows you to do is basically oversee everything that your child sees. So any assignments that are posted, announcements that are posted, messages that are sent to your student from the teacher, um, any due dates in the calendar, anything at all, you can see that. You are not able to submit assignments for students or complete assignments for students, but you have the ability to view everything. You can view teacher feedback, Pretty much everything that the student has access to, so do you, uh, with the exception of class rosters. So you will not be able to see any other student in the class or any of their work. Uh, and then along that same vein, because of that, you also won't be able to see discussion posts because those are also um, like a class where every student is posting. So it kind of limits your ability to see what other students post. Um, but it's really great. I mean, it's super easy to sign up. It's a great way, again, to kind of check in. And also, in one of the uh, guides, um, it does show how you can set your notification settings. And so you can get notified. If uh, Yes, it's right there. Observer notification preferences. And you can see, Mr. Maurer, uh, Dr. Maurer, if you wanted to zoom in on that a little bit, on that box there, um, Yes, yeah, so you can get notified of upcoming due dates, of grading policies, of course content whenever it's posted, if an announcement is posted, when grades are posted. Now, with grading, I do want to um, just give the little caveat that uh, the grades in Canvas are not considered like a final grade. Our Canvas gradebook is not synced to PowerSchool gradebook. So many teachers will will grade something in Canvas to provide that feedback. Canvas allows us to record voice comments, to type uh, much more individualized feedback for student work and their progress, which we can't always do in PowerSchool. However, 
not every assignment might be posted in Canvas. So teachers might have a paper assignment that's not going to show up in the Canvas gradebook. So therefore, the Canvas gradebook is, again, great to view some grades and feedback, but it is not uh, like a final grade. PowerSchool is definitely the way to go for final grades. But with that being said, again, anything that is graded in Canvas, you can still view that, view the feedback, understand um, maybe what went wrong or what went really well. Um, you know, teachers love to put good job comments on there and, and highlight the strengths as well. So Canvas as a parent observer is so wonderful, again, especially when you're trying to provide that independence while also knowing what's happening in the class and knowing if your child is submitting assignments, not submitting assignments, when big, um, when, um, big assignments are coming up. Yeah, so um, the steps to sign up are in that first link. It's a video tutorial. It is like step by step. Yeah, um, so like I said, that first link, the video is just a very quick overview, kind of gives you like the rundown and how to sign up. Um, the next, the observer guides is like huge. It's kind of everything. And the last link there is just the difference between the app and the web browser, because the app is somewhat limited in what you can see and what you can do, but the web browser, uh, like when you open it just on your laptop is what that's referring to. If you just were to open Canvas as an observer on your laptop, it mirrors what the students see. Um, and then I can I can give just a very quick, Dr. Maurer, I do have students coming in a moment, but I can give a very quick, just show my Canvas page and how it might look similar maybe to other teachers. So the first thing that you will see when you click into a student's course. So first of all, from a student's dashboard, they will see all of their courses listed here. These are all my courses that I currently teach, but students will see all of their courses that they're currently enrolled. So um, to go into my language arts course, you will first come to a home page. That home page is going to be individualized by the teacher, um, you know, kind of whatever things they want to post. Mine just has like a welcome, has some buttons for student navigation and, you know, just a inspirational quote. Everyone, every teachers will look different, but some things that are the same and that are going to be really helpful for you as parents is to know the buttons that are available. So let me just go into a student view quickly. So over here on the left, um, of the page left of the course is going to be their navigation so here's where you can go to announcements the modules the modules is the really the main thing that i wanted to highlight because this is where no matter what the teacher is the modules are where the content is pushed out worksheets pages google slides presentations review games you name it this is where it's going to be is under the modules um, so that's where, again, if you're looking for students' assignments or you want to read more about an assignment, if you were like, what is CMW and what is that? You can open up that page and see exactly the content that is in there. So within the modules, again, teachers can embed slides. They can embed worksheets. Um, this is where everything will be. And that is really the main thing from uh, canvas that I did want to highlight for you to see. Uh, the homepage will look different, but all of the content is going to be in the modules. Um, students do also have access to a calendar that keeps track of all of their dates, as well as an inbox. And that inbox is used to message other teachers. It does not work um, student to student. It's teacher to student and student to teacher only. Um, and you would have access to their inbox as well. So... Yeah, I hope that that was helpful. And again, the, I, I've seen, I've heard great feedback from the parents that I, of students that I currently have and, you know, just how they've said, it's just so helpful to kind of know what's happening and see, you know, what assignments are coming up? What are those long-term projects and when are their due dates? And I mean, we have everything embedded in there, even rubrics and things like that. So very helpful from what I've heard from other parents. So I definitely encourage you to sign up, absolutely. So thank you very much, Mrs. Harris. I, I think, um, you know, we found that Canvas became such an imperative tool. It, it was so important to use, especially in the beginning of the pandemic and how, you know, it's been exciting to see how everyone has grasped this. 
uh, app and uh, this service that has not been provided to our families, our students, our teachers, we would be lying if we if we said that it wasn't it hasn't been an overwhelming or an intimidating experience because canvas is so robust it is very comprehensive there is a lot to learn um i i would also say full disclosure that there are teachers students and parents that have varying levels of knowledge expertise in canvas so that's why we continue to make this a point to discuss this at really all levels we're, we're continuing professional development in it, in it for our teachers which stephanie has been such an important piece of being kind of a, a expert in our middle school um, and creating professional development opportunities for teachers but also our students learning the the program and how to use it how to communicate with with teachers um, and then also our parents as we continue to move forward with this um, we see more and more parents getting involved, getting a little bit more uh, comfortable with it. You know, as everything is new, change is always difficult. But I think as we continue to just take pieces of this and learn and grow through it, um, we've seen that it is just such a beneficial program for our families and, and for our staff as well. It's it's become an important part of the middle school experience now, especially uh, um, when students need to learn remotely. Um, it, it's become an important tool. So um, thank you so much, Mrs. Harris, for your help, your expertise in this area? Yeah, um, I did notice a question in the chat. So before I hop off here, I'll address that really quickly. Um, yes, so the main thing to focus on is the modules. Some teachers might choose to make other options viewable. For example, I made ClassLink viewable. Other teachers may not. Um, so however, with that being said, that doesn't necessarily mean students don't have access. That just means that it's found in the modules instead. So that's why I did want to highlight that. Uh, the modules are like the number one thing to focus on. Um, I don't make assignments viewable. Other teachers might. But if I want my students to complete an assignment, it's certainly on there. It's just in the modules instead. So yeah, really good question. I get that one all the time. Uh, but yes, I'm glad you asked too, so that I could clarify that. But um, same with announcements and homework. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, again, I'm happy to please reach out if you have any other questions. And Dr. Mauer, I my students are patiently, they're being so good, they're patiently waiting, but I am going to go ahead and, and let them in now. We completely um, understand. Absolutely. Thank you so yep. much for your time. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. So as Mrs. Harris said, um, Canvas really is, it is such a great tool. Um, I know even just for me as being new and learning all of the curriculum and really just diving in, um, I use the Canvas view. I have a little bit different view than you ha have as parents, but um, it, it just, it, the, mo the modules is so, they're so robust and you can really find so much information about the curriculum and what's happening. Um, in the classes through them. Uh, so the next topic we're going to transition to is advisory. Uh, and this kind of falls in line with the teaming aspect. Um, so the, the importance of advisory and connectedness to the school. So pre-pandemic, pre the middle school had an advisory program. Um, and we, Dr. Maurer and I, have been looking at the program and working with teachers and with former students. So we surveyed the current ninth and 10th graders. Um, and then we talked with all of our teachers about um, the, the, what they liked and what they didn't like and what they want to see changed and, and the maybe what could be added to the advisory program. So we are going to reinstate the advisory program this year. Um, we're targeting November um, to really get it underway. Um, so what we have done so far, the, and just to back up a little bit, the research on uh, connectedness to school, it, it's overwhelming um, how school connectedness impacts students' achievement, their mental health, and their decision making as they get older and as they go through middle and high school. Um, so there's a, a wide body of research that says when a school is, when a child is connected to at least one positive adult in school, that their, um, that their likelihood of engaging in risky behavior significantly drops. So we think it's really, really important for students to find one adult in the building with that they can connect with. And then at the same time, they're also connecting with other children that have similar interests or that are like-minded 
or that like the to do the same things as they do. So that forms that bond in another way as well. So our steps toward reinstatement this year have been, like I said, teacher input, student input from the, the current ninth and 10th graders. And man, these ninth and 10th graders, they are so, they are, they're so great. Their input has been really, really helpful. Um, we had about a hundred students respond to the survey and give very valuable input. Um, we are working on informing an advisory committee and then um, we had the teachers have created a teacher slideshow and this slideshow will help students find an advisor to whom they connect. Um, and so then we will begin the selection of an advisor. So I'm just gonna give you a, the kids have not seen this yet. So you guys get a quick little sneak peek into, um, oops, into the, the teacher slideshow. Um, and I'm not gonna go through every single one of them, but just to see, all right, it's taking a minute here. I was going to say, while you're pulling that up, I, I also wanted to just make kind of our parents on, on here aware that when we created this program a few years ago, we could not find a school in the area that was doing a, a program like this um, that, that really was as authentic as we wanted it to be. So we actually became, became the first school that we're even aware of that had students choose the adult advisor. So you have some mentor programs in the area, local surrounding schools, I won't name names, but have programs where adults are choosing the students they feel comfortable with. But it, but we really wanted a student-centered approach to, to this. We wanted the students to have the empowerment, the ability to choose the adult in the middle school that they felt connected to rather than the adults doing that work. So we created a unique program. And, and I would say also that other uh, schools have now taken on our model, especially the process of students choosing the adults they feel comfortable with in the school and matching up those. So we could we we could say that every student in the school was paired with a an advisor that they had chosen, uh, which which is pretty unique and, and something we feel very proud about. It's almost like the secret sauce of uh, of this program. And I saw a question in the chat. Um, what if all the students choose the same advisor? So they get to, um, they they will choose six or seven. And um, Dr. Deichler, she was our math whiz. She has an algorithm for that, that she is going to share with Dr. Maurer and I. So if the students pick, and we have to see the number of students this year, how it compares to a few years ago when it was done. Um, so <laughs> uh, they choose six or seven that they would be happy to have as their advisors. And then they're guaranteed one of those six or seven. So um, that's how we get it. So yeah, they can't just choose one. We wouldn't be able to accommodate that. But if they choose six or seven from from the their what they get to know about them uh, from these slides, then um, they get one of the their, the people of their choice. So I'll 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 share a little bit. Like so this, would, and Dr. Maurer and I also have a group. So. Um, you, we share just a little bit about the things that we like, the, the people in our lives, and then um, each teacher, each adult does a video um, just about, I'm not going to play my video, but uh, it's just about themselves and what they hope that you will get from them being an advisor, um, what they hope to bring to, to you as students. Um, so that one was mine. Here's uh, Mr. Ruffalo. Some of your kids might have Mr. Ruffalo. So Again, family, um, the, they have videos. Um, Mrs. Beinecke, who you got to meet a little bit earlier today. So every teacher, or every adult, um, I should say, in the building, so teachers, counselors, principals, um, has a slide. And these will be shared. They haven't been shared with the students yet. But these will be shared with the students. And they will have some time to take a look, watch the videos, um, see you know who shares some of their their same interests and um, and then pick their their top six or seven teachers or counselors or principal that they would like to be paired with um, as their advisor. I think I saw another um, question pop up in the chat. Um, so yeah, all the all of the teachers in the building uh, will be an advisor. And quite honestly, I even if we didn't ask for volunteers, I think they would all volunteer. And speaking with them in our mini team meetings, they all were really excited that this program is being reinstated because it gives the, the teachers, like selfishly as an adult, I can say selfishly as a principal, I don't always get that time to connect with kids the way I used to as a teacher. Um, and for the teachers, they don't, they, they haven't had the time to really connect because they're 
teaching, you know, so this is really great. Um, a great way to just relax, talk with kids, hang out with kids, do some fun things, um, and really just uh, have the kids relax and, and have a fun time. So I saw um, if this if it doesn't work out uh, well, yes, we, yes. we walk. Yeah. So right. there's a couple pieces I think that the other like proud pieces of this program that that we have, and one is that 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 if we really want to create an authentic program or if where students feel connected to an adult, that they do have that autonomy. They have if, if things aren't working out, if if they you know prefer if they have a stronger relationship with another, we we have worked with that. It's actually through our guidance department where we've worked with them and uh, in finding kind of who they feel the most connected to. Because it, again, if we want to make it an authentic program. Program, then we need to stand by that um, and not really, we don't want anyone to feel forced in this program in any way, especially at, you know, at the student level, um, we want them to feel that connection. There's some other pieces that we've kind of um, added some strategy to this. Um, when we talk about timeline of meetings, we've really tried to be strategic about when those occur. Um, we, do, we don't have homework over the long weekends or holiday weekends. So we, find, we found that coming back from that, uh, students you know, could benefit from having that adult that they talk to. Maybe uh, they didn't have the best weekend or something like that where they can meet with that adult, but also um, with no homework uh, that's that's due on, on that coming back from that long weekend and also no tests to prepare for. We found that that students and teachers kind of come into that, coming back to school and enjoy that uh, advisory right out of the gate, that time, that hour that we've uh, kind of built in in the past. And, and these are things we're all reevaluating as we reinstate the program. Um, but those are things that we have found to be beneficial uh, through that strategy. So yeah, you're asking, um, is there a standard framework? Uh, yes, we, we built the program on, on three pillars. It's peer connection, social, emotional uh, support, and, and also um, and, and personalized support as well. Um, one thing that we feel very strongly about too is this is the only time in the school day during the year that we have mixed grade levels coming together. So we have sixth, seventh, and eighth graders meeting with their advisor during this time. Never, ever in our schedule do we have sixth, seventh and eighth graders kind of um, being together in any courses, you know, whereas the high school, there might be some courses where there's ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th graders in a class. We don't have that. Um, as we said, we're in many teams. The students are really the same kind of 90 ish students with three teachers are together and then they venture to specials. Um, but this is a unique time where we have sixth, seventh and eighth grade students all mingling together during the school day, which we found kind of another benefit to it is you see some of that peer mentoring happening where you have some eighth graders kind of taking some sixth graders under their wing and showing them the way with that adult guiding that. So we have found some other benefits that I don't think we really even thought about when we brought this program up. We, it was kind of like, oh, yeah, this is the only time that, that we have three different grades uh, being together. So it, it's created an interesting element to the program as well. So our teachers have a, have some flexibility. We don't really prescribe what they're doing during this time. The teachers um, have to just make sure that those, uh, yes, sp special needs, everything is in the mix. Um, also, like I said, all students have that ability to, to uh, uh, select their mentor. That's all students. Um, so one thing that, as I was saying, is the teachers kind of have some the ability to cater to what the students are looking for from them. And we also realize that each adult brings something to the table that that child, that student found to be valuable or interesting. So we didn't want them to have prescribed lessons. They're not reading scripts. They're not. We do have a wide range of resources that we're sharing together as a community of, of um, advisors. So we have like a group, uh, a Google Drive, a shared drive that we share. You know, these are these are all great resources that fall under peer connection. These are all great resources that fall under academic support. And so we're pulling from those resources, but but uh, really the advisors kind of have the empowerment to work with the students to find what what's best for those. So they are meeting in, yeah, for sixth to eighth grade, uh, students are meeting with their mentor. It, it works out math wise to be about, I mean, it's been arranged, but um, usually no more than 15 students in, a, in an advisory group. Um, we do have our advisors um, 
they know that they are also to meet with students on an individual basis during that time as well. So there are opportunities to meet individually with that adult during that time. And uh, as we continue to kind of gauge how much time we feel we need for this program, we're, we're going to, to talk about those things. So all great questions. We hope that this gave an overview of, of really our goals, our focus. Uh, we do feel this is a, a, an important uh, part of our middle school model. We did have to kind of halt it and, and alter it during during the, especially last year with, with the pandemic, it, it just became very challenging to continue these things. Um, but now as we kind of get back to a more structured system in school, in person, more in-person learning, um, we want to get back to this because we know how important it is for our students. So also we um, have the Uplift platform, which we're so excited about because it, our students really love it. Um, they, they love to be able to share me nice messages, kind messages. Um, it was actually Dr. Deichler and myself that met uh, this guy named Doug Revis, who just has the most um, energetic personality, magnetic personality, just an incredible human being. Um, he, he had a wonderful presentation at our the National AMLE conference that we attended in Nashville. From there, we met him. We got connected to his platform. What it essentially is, is it's a platform for students, teachers, and parents to just send positive messages. Maybe it's shout outs to a friend, a peer, um, to, to a, a staff member, or to the whole middle school community. Um, and, and anyone can really do this. It's filtered through Dr. Cremona and myself. We go uh, through and approve these messages as they come through. Um, but uh, the whole idea is to kind of anonymously send a nice message. The more that we can spread kindness, the more that we're modeling the behaviors we want to see from our students. So right now it's being displayed um, in in the front television, the front uh, flat screen TV, when you come into the middle school, you'll be able to see it in the uh, vestibule area there. So um, you can see the messages just scrolling throughout the day. We also have teachers that kind of projected on their uh, computer and on the in their classrooms, especially during activity period. So the kids get to see those. We'd like to continue. Um, uh, putting up te te televisions in our cafeteria and our hallways where students can just see these messages right in front of them. And then we've shared these links uh, that you, there's two links. One is to see this showcase. They call it the kindness wall. And then there's also another link where you can submit a, a, a comment, a, a positive message that you'd like to put out. Um, we did have some parents say some uh, nice things, some kind messages about our curriculum night, and we thank them for adding those. Um, our students have said some some really great things about what the teachers are, have been able to accomplish this year um, with them and, and grateful for that. So um, just another way to spread kindness through our school. That's what we're really ultimately looking for. So just creating that community of kindness. And, and when we share this um, slideshow, if you if you are interested, um, those links will be in there as well. If you want to just scroll through and see what's scrolling on the kindness wall, or if you yourself would like to submit uh, a comment, um, you can certainly do that. Uh, the next thing we just wanted to let you know about is um, our schools to watch uh, redesignation. So um, in 2000 and the 2015-16 school year, South Fayette Middle School was designated as a um, Pennsylvania and a national schools to watch. Um, and then in 2018-19 school year, uh, there was a redesignation. And then this is now the redesignation two. And what's the reason why it's important, it's nice to have an accolade, um, but the, the best thing about the Schools to Watch is it really forces us to look inward uh, and to do a self-study as to what we are doing here in our middle school to keep us on track as a middle school, as a true middle school, making sure that we are focusing on academic excellence, developmental responsiveness, um, social equity, the organization and structure of our school. So that's like when we were talking about teaming model and block scheduling, uh, making sure that those are, are working for us. Um, we look into demographics and te um, characteristics and test scores, attendance rates, discipline records. Uh, we look into programmatic information such as schedules, departments, courses, interventions, uh, the special programs for our ELL and our IEP students. And then we also looked into our school climate and culture. And what's great about this application process and um, especially as I was coming in kind of new to the process and new to the district and the, and the building, um, what we took from that are now our future 
our future, the what we are going to do in the future, our next steps um, after looking at this. So maybe taking a closer look at um, you know some of the places, especially you know in our last couple of years on our test scores, or maybe where we have historically needed to work more, and how we can disperse some of that that job to not just our math science and ELA teachers, but how we can get our specials teachers involved and how, and they're so willing to get involved um, with, with some of that, that piece. Um, looking at our climate and culture and is there anything like the U Uplift pr uh, platform or anything like that that we can add to help with that climate and culture. Um, we are noticing a lot of students this year are struggling um, in that with the social emotional piece and some of that anxiety and, and, and really reacclimating themselves back into school. Uh, I saw a, a, a I saw a post on Facebook, actually, and it was about the normal school year. And so our kids who are in seventh grade this year, the last time they had a normal school year, they were in fourth grade. Our sixth graders were in third grade. Our eighth graders were in fifth grade. So really just um, this, this process in Schools to Watch helped us um, look at it through that type of lens where these, where, where, how can we help our kids who may be struggling? They haven't had a five day this year. It's the first time they had a five day in-person school year, school week since March of 2020. So really just supporting our students, our counselors have reported some, you know, kids are, are struggling just with that, that piece alone. So this schools to watch process helped us look inwardly um, to see how we can now help our students moving forward. Did I, Dr. Maurer, I think I stole your slide, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry. Hey, no problem at all. I can talk a little bit about attendance. I know um, this has been a hot topic this year. Um, as, as far as our, our attendance procedures go, these, these seem to, you know, they do kind of change each year. This year, we did change our percent, our attendance procedures as compared to last year. So it's been a little bit of a learning curve for everybody, not just our parents, but also students and, and our staff getting used to kind of as, as we transition back to more structure, uh, how we are going to be doing things. So um, as far as our health and safety plan goes, we continue to use the daily health assessment. We ask parents to conduct this every morning with your child. Um, we want to, want to keep everyone safe. We want to continue to uh, keep everyone safe. As much as a, our education is our priority, we want to make sure that continues by uh, following the health screening every morning with your child. So you can see here a list of eight questions that we ask you to, to uh, ask of you and your child in every morning. Um, if and, and if you want to scroll there, Dr. Cremont, if, if any of the um, answers to those are you know, uh, different and show that there might be an illness, then we've given steps to take. Um, we're going to say this over and over again. Our school nurse, she's a superhero, first of all. Um, M Misty Minarchek is our school nurse. She has been such a key uh, point person for us through this pandemic. She's she's our middle school health expert. Um, we, we use her so much, she'll tell you. Um, through this and our parents have found her to be so helpful as well um, a great resource as to what are the next steps because as the as the pandemic continues to change and um, guidelines change you know what seems to be by the minute um, we follow cdc we follow our allegheny county health department officials we have a great relationship with the allegheny county health department and our nurses are on the front lines of that with communication so they are the the uh, experts um, we also work with Kara Miles, our lead nurse for the school district. Uh, we also have a um, district physician that we that we work closely with. So um, we always direct parents to our school nurse. Our best practice has been to contact Misty Menard, check our school nurse, if you see that your child is ill, and she will guide you then with the next steps. Um, but Dr. Cremona, if you want to talk about just our VTL, our quarantine, our return to school checklist, we can go through that as well. Sure. So, um, if you uh, if your child is experiencing any of these um, above, again, like Dr. Maurer said, contact the school nurse. If it is something that would require your child to have a COVID test, which 
honestly, most of those um, symptoms, we're going to ask that the child gets a COVID test. Um, once that is determined that they are awaiting a result of a COVID test, then they, are they will have access to virtual learning and they will be marked VTL, which means that the, the teachers will turn on their cameras and their Google Meets and your child can join virtually, join in the class. Um, so it, it's really, that's why we say to ask uh, talk to Misty first, because um, I know that it, it is, it's as clear as mud, to be honest, <laughs> um, whenever you're looking at it and trying to navigate it. So when you talk to Misty, she can say, yes, I need you to get a, a, a COVID test. And as they're waiting their COVID test, they'll have access virtually. Also, if, if your child was um, deemed a close contact here in school, um, that's when we would put them on quarantine. And at that point, they would also have access to virtual learning. So um, anytime that we are asking them or telling them they cannot come to school because they have been a close contact with somebody who has tested positive, um, students are, have access to virtual learning at that time as well. They, the times, um, so I can give you a, an example. So, and I'll just I'll put it out there. My my daughter is in first grade, had COVID at the very beginning of the school year. So she was out. She, you know, she is in first grade. So we went to Canvas. Um, but then just uh, last week, last Thursday, she had a stomach bug. So had she been here in the middle school, she would not have had virtual learning access because it wasn't a COVID related issue. So um, we knew that she wouldn't have COVID because she had just had it four weeks ago. And um, so she did not, she could still join on Canvas if she wanted, but um, at, at the middle school, so they would still have access to Canvas, but they wouldn't have that virtual, that Google Meet um, access to the, to the classroom. So that's the difference there. So when we are saying you can't come to school um, because of a COVID related issue, then students are able to join in the Google Meets um, when they're sick. And, and quite honestly, like I'll, with my example, my daughter was sick, like she really couldn't do much Canvas work, but they still always have access to Canvas. They always have access to message their, their teachers um, to ask questions. Um, but that virtual learning is reserved for those students who are um, have either tested positive for COVID or awaiting COVID test results. Or the, uh, after speaking with the school nurse, she says, I don't, uh, your child needs to stay home um, because of potential COVID related symptoms. So that's the, that is the district wide. There's like really three ways that, that the, the child has access to the virtual learning, um, but students always have access to Canvas, always have access to those modules and to message their, their teachers. Um, so I just wanted, I know it's, it, it's confusing and honestly, like until it impacts you, it, you don't really have to pay attention to it. So I found that as a parent and I work in the district, like I wasn't really paying attention to exactly what would have to happen. But now when it impacts you, then it's, then it's there. Um, I see there's a question in the chat. While you're reading that, Dr. Kamau, I'll also say as one of the um, district level co-safety directors, um, I have found, too, that, you know, talking with parents through these situations where they now need to get tested, we have found that really the the highest high the most highest rated way to get tested right now for you or your child is through curative it's called um and it's by going to curative.com c-u-r-a-t-i-v-e.com um there is a testing site in bridgeville it's actually the old taco bell they've transitioned into there you'll see a trailer there and you can go through the, the drive through of the old taco bell where they have a queue but um very easy to sign up for a test they have a couple hundred test uh, slots available daily. Um, it, it is right there in Bridgeville, very close to uh, home. And also uh, we have been seeing, and it's also a PCR test. So a PCR test is the most trusted. It's the it's kind of the top level test where it's sent out to a lab. The lab then uh, gives you the results and they will tell you 24 to 48 hours. But we have seen most of our um you know, people, uh, students, I would say students and, and staff members that get tested, we're seeing results in less than 24 hours. So very quick turnaround, very easy process. You do it right in your car. Um, so we recommend using curative. I know a lot of people think Med Express is the way to go, but they seem to be very short staffed right now. And we're seeing long wait times to get tested there. So uh, just some advice there from our end. Um, so Amber, to answer your question, um, this was a, that was a district um, decision about the question was uh, why are kids only uh, 
COVID tested or quarantine kids given virtual access. So that was something that we talked about early in the um, school year that there was a district wide um, decision. And there were many factors that went into that um, decision. Um, some of which are if a child is is sick and can't sick, like for instance, with a, with a stomach flu and can't come to school, then we wouldn't want them to feel as though they have to be on virtual learning. Um, and then another one was, and, and I know we don't like to think of you know the negative aspect of it, but then it, it would be, a, well, I'm just not going to come to school today. I can just get on virtually. Um, and we know uh, that students learn best when they are face to face and when they are in school. So um, you know, we didn't want to encourage just not coming to school and saying, oh, I'll just join virtually. Um, so is that something that maybe we we want want to revisit? We we constantly are talking about the pros and the cons, um, but that was the biggest reason that that decision came came as it did. I just real quickly, I saw um, Shannon's question in here. Dr. Herring's group does have a presence at the middle school. Um, the middle school shout group just met for the first time last week, and they actually did a combined meeting with the high school shout group, um, and it was. It was pretty cool uh, to see them. They were, they're decorating lockers. They're doing these handprints with positive sayings and they're gonna put them on every single middle schooler's locker. So um, yeah, they, they do have that. Um, so thank you, um, Amber, for the, the comment as well. And, and, and Aaron, I see in there as well. Um, so thank you for that. And, and like we said, we, we, are, we are constantly keeping this at the forefront. So thank you. Okay, so as we get closer to the end of our presentation today, um, we wanted to just make this a focus. Uh, we know, as Dr. Cremona had already said, we're, we're seeing students that are coming with some struggles, you know, and, and we anticipated this. And I think that our district has as well. Our school board does take uh, this very seriously also. And there have been some additions uh, through this uh, pandemic of adding a, a school social worker. Um, so we are so grateful to have the resources we have in our school. As far as our school counselors go, we have three now. We added an additional additional counselor as well. Um, we felt that, that we wanted our students to be seen as soon as they need to be seen. And uh, in order to do that, as we continue to grow and and um, this part of this growing pains we, we want to make sure that we have enough staff to serve our students so uh, we have now instead of having just two counselors we have three mrs justina parat um, and mr michael parat there they are a married couple they're a, a tag team duo we love having them um, as a resource for our students and we also just uh, hired a few years ago now miss taylor connors and um, you'll see that there are letters there. What we do is um, we kind of do an alpha cut by thirds, um, but that does really only that is for clerical reasons. So if it comes to um, academics, if they're working on, on anything with, uh, as far as academics go, Mrs. Uh, Parat would oversee students with last names A through G, uh, Ms. Connors would be H through O, and Mr. Parat would be any student with last names P through Z. And like I said, that's really just for clerical purposes when it comes to kind of bookkeeping, housekeeping, those type of things. But we, we say that if a student would like to, maybe it's a female student that would like to speak to a female, but has Mr. Parat as their counselor, they can certainly see any of the three counselors or, like, or vice versa. If there's a male student that has a female counselor, but would like to speak it maybe on a mail issue with Mr. Parat. Um, we, we are extremely flexible with that. So our three counselors really just kind of tag team all situations, all, all students needs um, and, and really try to accommodate it as you know as they need. As I said, we are we also have a school social worker, Mr. Uh, Tanner Jones, who has been able to help us in a wide variety of needs. Uh, he has been bringing materials to houses um he's been he's been doing a lot for us and it's great to have him in the school he can kind of provide some other things that that our staff members may not to be able not be able to provide he's also a liaison with different agencies outside agencies maybe it's uh, through attendance um, and kind of a focus on attendance there or maybe it's mental health services that can be provided um, he is kind of our liaison for those as well. And speaking of those services, uh, we do have school-based mental health services 
available. They are not our own mental health services that we provide. They're, it's actually an outside, a third party group that is processed through families insurance. But the convenience of it is we can use our own school setting to be the place so that you're not having to pull, pull your child out, um, you know, a couple days a week or, you know, or a month where you have to go and pull them out and bring them to a uh, another location. It can happen right in our own school. We have the space in our school that's private, kind of tucked away from the flow of traffic and uh, provides uh, a mental health service provider with students. And, and it really, it's just uh, in-house so they don't have to leave the school. So it, it, we found that to be very beneficial for our students as far as mental health services go. So those are all of our available resources for students. We're grateful to have them. And, and we have found that our students do use these services um, throughout the day. Uh, they should feel comfortable with, you know, just asking their teacher, uh, I'd like to go speak to a counselor. This is where you come in as parents as well. If you could help support that idea. Uh, we know that sometimes students may not feel, you know, I don't, I don't want to kind of put things out there, but then they see the benefit of talking with a counselor and being able to maybe express their feelings, work through uh, maybe a relationship breakdown in class or, or in school or friendships, working through those type of things. Our counselors are great for that. So as, as a parent, if you could support by just, by just kind of breaking down that wall, uh, letting them feel comfortable with coming to talk to a counselor at any time um, as we do have those available for them. So uh, we just wanted to make that make you aware of those services. Uh, the other thing that is new, well, some of it's new this year. Um, we are on Twitter uh, as the SFF, SFMS Lions. So if you have Twitter, uh, we try we post regularly uh, on there. So please follow us. And we, you can also search our middle school hashtag if you're looking for a very just middle school specific stuff. Um, and you can see that hashtag there, that SFMS Lion Pride. And then anything district wide, we're also hashtagging as SF Lion Pride. So if you just wanna see, if you put that into Twitter, you'll see things happening at the elementary, the middle, the high school, um, the intermediate school, student services, athletics. So everybody's kind of adopted that, um, that hashtag. And then um, at the middle school, we're also on Instagram. And so um, we use the same at SFMS Lions and post on Instagram. And then the other um, place to get information is our school website. And we are uh, making sure that we're trying to continually um, update that website. There's also, if you're not on Twitter, but you want to see what's happening on Twitter, we have embedded the Twitter feed onto our school website. So when you go to the middle school website, you can actually see what, what has been posted on Twitter. Um, and that just is our way of kind of breaking down the walls. Um, right now, you're, we're all virtual um, having this meeting. And I think it's so nice to be able to see what's happening inside the building. So this is our way of trying to show you what's happening um, inside the building while we're still trying to be cautious about being inside the building. Uh, so if you um, just want to follow us, that would be awesome. And then, uh, okay. Is that no, we just uh, wanted to end our presentation today with um, a list of some upcoming events happening in our school. Uh, one part of our this uh, parent advisory association, we we want to um, our, our council, we want to make parents aware of of the hap what's happening in our building. That's really the main goal of this. Um, we know that there's a transition from the elementary grades to middle school, and and how how parents kind of fit into the piece of, of the puzzle of support. Um, don't get us wrong. We certainly want parents to feel that they, you know, that they can still support their child. Um, we need you, especially when it comes to the social emotional piece of navigating things, uh, friendships, relationships with um, peers and those type of things. So um, as much as, as you can get involved, the better. Uh, as far as some upcoming events here, we do have a two hour late start on the 18th. Our, our Halloween dance. We can't believe it's back. We're so excited to be able to provide this. It's actually our Lion Hearts Club, our middle school Lion Hearts Club under the direction of uh, Dr. Conchetta Bell. Um, 
is sponsoring Halloween dance and uh, information is, is coming out regarding that through our school messenger. Uh, the past survey is going to be given um, in social studies classes coming up uh, the week of the 27th. And this comes through our counseling services. It is a social emotional screener um, to try to uh, find students that may be, uh, that may have needs that need to be addressed. So it, it just helps um, for students to kind of, for our staff to identify uh, student needs that may arise. Uh, we also have the end of the nine weeks. It's hard to believe it's coming up. Um, the end of the nine weeks will be coming up on October 28th. School for students on the 29th. Uh, our picture retake day had to be rescheduled. Um, we've been working with Redford Photography. Um, some supplier issues with uh, shipping times and those type of things have been um, have caused a little bit of a hiccup, but Redford has been working with us closely with us so that we can uh, make sure that the pictures do get to families, but we didn't want to have a retake day before families saw the, didn't get to see the first picture. So, um, we needed to move that back a little bit and we appreciate everyone's patience on that. Our, the new delay date will be November 3rd for those and the pictures should be, um, should, should, families should have access to those photos before the retake, the new retake date. November 5th, report cards will be available on PowerSchool. These are not printed out, so it's important um, that you have access to PowerSchool. If you do not have access to PowerSchool, please send an email to one of our administrative assistants. They can give you the uh, login information for you. You do need a like information from us. You can't just create a username password on your own. You need a PIN that we would give you uh, to access your child's uh, report card and uh, their grades on power school as mrs harris said power school is kind of the end result it's after the grades have already been inputted um, we do ask parents to use canvas to see what's upcoming power school is not the place to see kind of what's coming up there might be some assignments posted by a teacher that that are predated and, and it says that they're coming up but that is really our kind of after the fact once all grades are into power school that's where you see the snapshot of your child's academic uh, achievement so um please e email one of our administrative assistants, Megan Koliakovo or Rebecca Bruce to get access to PowerSchool. And then finally, another important piece of the middle school model is our student-led parent conferences. This is unique. Um, you won't see this in every middle school. Uh, a lot of middle schools still have a traditional parent-teacher conference where the students kind of left out of it. It's, it. We do feel that's very important to integrate the student into the process. The elephant in the room is the student. They should be the one kind of talking about what they've been able to achieve, what are some areas of weakness that, that we want to continue focusing on. So our um, teams of that we've already talked about our teams of teachers will work with students to help them prepare uh, presentations. There is an option to have a traditional uh, parent teacher uh, option, and we can, and, and that will be discussed by uh, teams of teachers through communications. But for the most part, our students have really, I mean, this is not the first year we've done this uh, year after year. Our students seem to take um, more initiative and they seem to really enjoy the process because it puts them in the center. After all, this is what we're talking about. You know, why talk about them when they're not there? Let's talk about them with them. So uh, just to talk, highlight those things. And they get to use some cool Google tools that I've seen students put together Google websites uh, where, where they have kind of their own digital portfolio that they get to showcase. And you just see them kind of that uh, that pride that they have in presenting for their parents and teachers. So it's a unique experience that we feel is, is an important part of our middle school model. And so that's all we have um, for you for today. Our next Parent Advisory Council meeting will be on January 22nd, um, but certainly if there are ever any questions, concerns, comments, um, anything that you need to get in touch with us about, um, we, are, we are here. Um, you can give us a call, shoot us an email, and uh, we are happy to talk with you and to discuss um, anything 